there because I'm going to continue what I shared last Sunday. Um, and the title last Sunday was Not Knowing After the Flesh, so this will be number two. <clears throat> and I'm sharing a couple of weeks in a row, not because... Um, what? <clears throat> yeah, mainly because... Um, here in a very short time, I'll be uh, having that operation, and I'll be down for a little while. So I thought, instead of just leaving a big load on all these guys, I would try to fill in beforehand as much as I could. <clears throat> Romans 8 is where we sort of began this little situation. <clears throat> and we noticed in Romans 8, verse 1, that there seemed to be some sort of a contradiction, some sort of a contrast <clears throat> that, that could be perceived as a contradiction when in reality the Bible does not contradict itself. Um, however, <clears throat> there are various scriptures that, oh, I guess to use spiritual terms, there are various scriptures that mess with us. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> we, we can't seem to grasp the the good parts because of our concepts of the bad parts of, or of what we think the bad parts are. Romans 8 verse 1 says this, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Okay, so that's the good part, amen? The second part comes along and it says, who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Okay, so <clears throat> um, there is this contrast between that which is in Christ and therefore being in Christ, what, what represents Christ or Christ is the representation of, the reality of, as opposed to our walk in the earth. <clears throat> and many times our primary focus is more upon our walk than it is upon the resurrected Christ and what he stands for in heavenly places. And the Bible says in Ephesians that we have been raised up and made to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And the wording, the grammar there is past tense. It's past tense. We have been. This, these, are, these are godly realities, spiritual realities that took place when, the, when Jesus was raised from the dead. And that as far as God is concerned, I mean, think about it. <clears throat> if, the Lord, if the Father is going to look for Christ, we know that he was raised up from the dead, made to sit at the right hand, what does it say in, a, in a Hebrews, at the right hand of the majesty on high. If God's going to look for Jesus, he'll just look to his right. His first place to look for Jesus is not going to be in you because he'd like to see more than that. It's a joke, people. <laughs> but it's not a joke. <clears throat> uh, because we are not totally conformed to the image of Christ, amen? But, but we are in his son, and that to the Father is the thing that gave Jesus the right to sit down. We were seated with him in heavenly places, and God the Father in his righteousness would never let him sit down if the work was not finished. <clears throat> the work finished in us, or shall I say, in us in Christ. Uh, as opposed to how well we're doing in our walk, which, frankly, some days is good and some days we're not doing so good. So we have this, what looks like an apparent contrast, and yet we find that the chapter before this is a description of someone who wants to serve God and please God, but every ounce of that, that desire to please God is focused in one primary area, how he lives, Romans 7. Amen? How he lives on the earth. So it ends <clears throat> that chapter going into what we've just read, O oh, wretched man that I am. That's the next to the last verse as it goes into this. O oh, wretched man that I am. In other words, <clears throat> 
you know, I want to do better for the Lord, up for, you know, just to use some simple terms here. I would like to do a lot better than what I'm doing for the Lord. And the, heart, the stronger my desire rises to please the Lord, to honor the Lord, to be with the Lord, to go after the Lord, it seems like the worse I get. <clears throat> the conclusion, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall, who, who? not what shall deliver me. Most Christians would read that, oh, wretched man that I am, what shall deliver me? What 10 steps? But the answer is a person. The answer is Christ. The answer is the real Jesus. The answer is not us. It's not 10 steps. It's not even us doing the best we can. It is us recognizing the work of God in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand far above all principalities and powers and mights and dominions which are named whether that be in heaven or in earth <clears throat> and to and to see that more more than as a doctrine but to see that as can I call it this to see that as our first reality our first reality, our first truth, our first um, embrace of Christ. And so his, the last verse in Romans 7, I thank God through Jesus Christ. And here he has, remember now, all the way through Romans 7, it is a relationship of, I want to please you. God is kind of you know, up in heaven and we're down here and we're trying to do all this stuff to please him. That's Romans 7, perfectly. But when he gets to the last verse, he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ because he's, something has changed. It's no longer God is up there and I'm down here trying to please him, an old wretched man that I am. But the thing that voids out the wretchedness is Christ in a different way than all of what Romans 7 has spelled out up to the last verse. Think about it. Because he, he's going to describe that last verse in the next verse, which is the one we just read. There is, therefore, now. When is, when is it going to be now? Well, it's always now. And it's always God's truth now. There is no condemnation in Christ. And the Christ that he thanked, the Jesus that he's thanking God for, I thank God through Jesus Christ, is the resurrected Christ in whom we dwell and more importantly, who is now our life and our identity before God. Our identity before God. To be known um, and we got into that scripture, so let me just finish this before I say that. So when he says to those who are in Christ, who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit, contrary to most of our carnal minds, this is not a reference back to Romans 7 of our walk and how we're failing. He finished that out. Now he's thanking God. You know, now he, there's no condemnation. Now he's living on another plane. <clears throat> the, the walking in the flesh here is living according to your life in this earth instead of his life and you raised up with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That that's your life. That Jesus is your life. And, and we say that. I mean, we, you know, we go, well, Jesus is my life. And we kind of pat our chest, you know. Well, yeah, he is. I don't deny that. I, I firmly believe in that. But he is, as the vine and us as a branch, the source, the roots and everything are, are in heavenly place, or in resurrection. That's where it flows from. And if you ignore that, if you ignore the root, then you're not made partaker of the root and fatness of the vine nor of the fruit, that the fatness being the fruit, the things that, it, that he brings forth through us, you are simply a Roman 7 Christian or you are a Jew trying to serve God through the law by works, by doing works, meaning you doing the right thing 
instead of it being the fruit of God, or the fruit of his life. We, we call it the fruit of the Spirit. We've never called it the fruit of the believer. And it'll never be the fruit of the believer, at least what God accepts. And besides, if we produced, if we produced love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness, faith, long-suffering, if we produced all of the fruit of the Spirit that is mentioned there, it wouldn't be called fruit. It would be called works. But the fruit of the Spirit is the actual result of the being that is God. <clears throat> We're not God. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. We are branches, and Jesus said that. I, or, you know, I don't, I don't want to argue with Jesus about that, do you? <laughs> Jesus says we're his branches. And he says, abide in me, in me, in me. That's what he said. He didn't say abide with me. Keep walking, fellas. You know, talking to the disciples. Keep walking with me. No. In fact, along that line, he spells it out that I must go away in this form right here. And I'm going to come back, but I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, and he's going to start revealing me to you. Well, they're kind of going, what? what are you talking about? We've been with you three and a half years. We know you. And he's going, no, you know me in, in incarnation. You don't know me in resurrection, and therefore you don't know you yet. You don't know you by Christ. You only know you with Christ, talking to the 12 disciples. All right. So we went to uh, 2 Corinthians, and if you'll turn, we'll just hit this again. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I think it was, yes. And we read 14 through 15, and I'm sorry that the introduction's taken a little longer, but I think, uh, as I thought about it when we were in Arkansas, I thought, you know, I need to make sure, I need to bring everybody <clears throat> up to where we were last time. <clears throat> All right, so this is 2 Corinthians 5, <clears throat> excuse me, verse 14. For the love of Christ, for the love of Christ, people. <laughs> for the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then all are dead. Notice it didn't say that it, we thus judge that if Jesus died, then we don't have to die. <clears throat> it says if Jesus died, then we all died because we all died with him. Okay. All right. <clears throat> what is that introducing in that? It's introducing an in Christ reality. We didn't die. Jesus didn't have 80 billion crosses around him where he said, okay, now you get on that one and you get on this one and you're going to die and you're going to die. He didn't do that. He took us all up into himself and in him we are dead, even though we didn't know it when we got born or born again until the Holy Spirit began to reveal what the cross really was about, the cross and the resurrection. That it was more than an event, that it was more than there was a guy and he was a good guy, but they killed him. But thank God, later he got up. You know, that's the story. Is that really? Really? You know? <laughs> you know, he's down, but he's up. You know? <clears throat> Can't keep a good man down. Jesus was not a good man. Jesus was the body of our death, or we are the body of his death, and, and he was the reality that took us to the cross, the one, the, the substance of that, any of that scripture that says that, not that we put ourselves to death. You can't put yourself to, you know, Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. It's impossible to crucify yourself. I mean, you get one nail in your feet and one in your hands, and then you still got the hammer in the other hand. You cannot crucify yourself. <laughs> only God can bring, only by Christ can we enter into this. And it's something that you must enter into by faith. You must believe the work of the cross. <clears throat> all right. So, if one died for all, then all are dead. And that he, <clears throat> he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but him who died and rose again. Okay, so it doesn't say we should live unto Jesus 
that, wa that was before the world ever began and that existed all the way up till the incarnation. And we should, be we should believe and, and, and um, live unto Jesus that walked and he healed the multitudes and he did all these things and we should live unto that good. It doesn't say that, folks. It says that we should henceforth not live unto ourselves in our life for God, but unto him that died and rose again. It is very specific about who to live unto because you died with him and you rose with him. You live unto him who died and rose. You live unto that, I'm going to say it like this, you live unto that him reality. There. You know, not, not Romans 7 trying to measure up to Jesus way up there who did everything right and never sinned and never failed and then sat down and said, okay, now you do it. <laughs> Good luck. You know, but that would be living under the him that is external from we should henceforth not live unto ourselves in our life. Romans, Romans 8, 1, not walk after this life for God, but live in Christ and walk after the reality that is true in Christ, him that died and we died with him and him that rose again. And he just said in the verse above it that we died with him. You know, love of God constraineth us that if one died, then we're all dead. Live unto that. And then live unto him that rose again. The same one who brought us into death brings us into his life. And that life is first and foremost not in us, but is him that died and rose again, and we were raised up together and made to sit together in heavenly places. Live to that identity. <clears throat> All right. So let's see the next verse. Therefore... Well, I didn't finish 16. Wherefore, henceforth we know... No, no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, now henceforth we know him no more. Well, did they know Jesus after the flesh? Yes. What was that? What, what relationship was that? What reality was that? Right there, him walking with us. Well, Jesus, just walk with me. Well, you know, I mean, I remember when I first got born again, and I was, I was upset that I was born in the time period that I was. I wanted to be born when Jesus came and walked the earth, and I wanted to walk with him. And I thought I was cheated until I realized that he's closer to me now than he was then. He's in me. I'm in him. And this was the, this was the relationship that he wanted. And I, so I gave up the relationship I wanted. I wanted to line up with the word of God. I wanted to line up with, with his heart. I wanted to, to give up. All of my thoughts of me with Jesus, you know, so we could take a photo together and put it on Facebook. Look, look, you know, me and Jesus hang out, you know what I mean? But now that you can take a picture of me and Jesus together, but you pretty much see him unless it is his life coming out in his way. You know what I'm saying? And you can shoot all you want up towards heavenly places and never get a picture of the reality that only the Holy Spirit can emblazon into your psyche of what is true and what all this means beyond religion and just talk and theology and, and it transforms you. The, the transformation, folks, isn't from bad to good. It's from dead to life, from death to life. And he's the life. <clears throat> all right, and so... It says, look, we even knew Jesus after the flesh. No more do we know him. <clears throat> the next verse is going to tell you how we know him, okay? And that's verse 17. Um, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. Okay, here's that same phrase. If any man be in Christ, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. There is this concerted effort of the Bible to bring us out of living in the flesh, meaning not, not, not living in, you know, <clears throat> we would think uh, I'm living in the flesh when I go out here and I do something wrong and I, I you know, uh, I, you know, 
promote myself or I go do, you know, I go get drunk or I don't know, you know, I'm having a hard time thinking of all the things that most people would call the flesh, but it's just as much the flesh. In fact, that's the flesh he's describing here is to try to live unto God apart from God's reality of death, burial, and resurrection. And just say, well, it's as if the death, burial, and resurrection never happened. Now I live unto God, you know, um, uh, the way the Jews do. I got news for you. That covenant is over and that covenant relationship is over. There's a new covenant. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. There, in him, seated in heavenly places, behold, all things have become new. Do we yet manifest? No, we see not yet all things under his feet. That's what it says in Hebrews. But we see Jesus. And it goes on crowned with glory and honor. There it is. There it is. And he is the life of the body, and we're the body of Christ. But that reality of body of Christ, first and foremost, is most real in Christ more than it is down here. And I could go off on that, but I won't. But it's, it's just a fact that it's the true fullness. And that's what he called it, the, the, the church, the body of Christ, the fullness of him, the fullness of him, the body of Christ. Well, you don't see that a lot in the earth, do you? I rest my case. All right. So... Um, Behold, all things have become new. Now, I'll just say this, and then we'll move on to our next scripture. <clears throat> Since you've become a Christian, and you're now in Christ, is everything new? Everything just new? No old stuff in you, or in your way, or in your attitudes, or... Well, in reality, no, because it didn't say that's true in you. It said it's true in Christ. Okay? And... The Jesus that we look at and become conformed to his image is that Jesus. Your identity changes from you to you in Christ. That's the face, the resurrected face that we must behold and be changed. Transformation, that's the word, transformation, transform, metamorphosis. It's the same of being a, from a caterpillar to a butterfly. It is a metamorphosis. It's not a, oh, I changed my mind. I'm going to be a Christian now. Or I, I changed my mind. I'm not going to, instead of going out and just getting drunk today, I'm going to, I'm going to go home and read the Bible. That's, that's not a metamorphosis. <laughs> I mean, good for you, but that's not a metamorphosis. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, okay, so uh, let's go to Philippians. Chapter 3, and that what you've heard just now, that's my introduction. Or at least my first introduction. Philippians 3 and verse 13 and 14. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. Okay, well... This is Paul talking, and he was a pretty good dude, amen? If he hadn't apprehended yet, I don't think we have. All right, but listen to what he says. Count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Okay, now, <clears throat> we normally read that as, okay, I'm going to forget, you know, what I did to my mama when, you know, da-da-da-da, or my brother or sister or you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to forget those things. I'm going to put behind all the bad things I did. But this, again, is in relationship to, this whole book is trying to bring us into a reality of, of uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil to the tree of life. It's trying to take us out of the religion that uh, they had by serving God through the law or serving God through works, or serving God through you gaining righteousness based on how good you're doing. Can I say it any more plain than that? 
So when he says forgetting those things which are behind, he's talking about a whole way of dealing that God dealt with us in the past. And he's Jewish and he's saying, I'm, I have to lay all of that way down. And notice, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God, where? In Christ Jesus. Not by Christ Jesus or with Christ Jesus, but doing the same thing that um, 1 Corinthians 5, 17 said. Therefore, if any man's in Christ, now you're not going to know one another after the flesh, the flesh being your life for God. Romans 8, 1. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a... Or a um, uh, Therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ who walk not after their way of trying to attain. And then he says, look, it's not like I've attained, but I'm tr pressing toward a mark, the mark, the mark of the prize of the high calling. Okay, there's a lot of callings in our life, folks. You can be called to be a missionary. You can be called to minister to children. You can be called to, you know, you can be called to a, you know, you can, you can put it like this. You can be called to, you know, marry a certain person or you can be called, all of these, all of these, but this is the only time it, it, it says there's a high calling, a higher calling, and it's in Christ. So if you fulfill all the callings, and miss this one. This is the one that counts. I mean, they all count, but you understand what I'm saying. I, it, 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 this is the foundation upon which all of them have to be built. <clears throat> and so the, the question arises then, are you pressing towards this mark? Is this the, the thing that you're pressing into to leave behind the old way of relating to God? Jesus said, I must go away because you'll keep relating to me in this manner. But I'm going to be raised up and seated and you are going to find yourself in me. And so he goes, you know, the scriptures go through all of these kind of relationships of I in you and you in me. And he says it over and over. Remember in, in uh, what is it, um, John 14 verse 20 where he says, at that day you shall know. I mean, I've always just felt like I could hear the excitement in Jesus when he's speaking to his disciples about a day that's going to take place after he's gone from this relationship to that. At that day you will know, you will know that I am in you and you're in me and you're going to live based on that instead of, you know, the old. Old things have passed away. Press toward the mark. Can you hear it all? You know, uh, um, even the words, the wording there in, in 1 Corinthians 5, be ye reconciled to God. That's not talking to sinners, folks. That's not. That's talking about Christians to come to the reconciliation that only happens in Christ. Instead of Jesus doing, oh, I'm standing over there and Jesus is here and he does a work for me and then I shake his hand. I go, I'm reconciled to God. He, we are reconciled to God in Christ in, in 1 Corinthians 5, uh, particularly from verse 14 on down, really spell that out. Really spell it out. They make absolutely sure that we understand that by being in him, we're reconciled to God because God receives his son. <laughs> and, and, and how secure is that? What's well, eternal? That's eternal. That is not, that, that can fall under attack a million times and Jesus will never fall. I mean, that's how you defeat this. You knock Jesus off the throne or more importantly, you knock us out of him. You know, like if the devil hit Jesus and we went flying out of him. Okay. Well, first of all, I don't think the devil's going to hit Jesus anymore after the cross. Okay. I think you are secure in Christ, not secure with Christ or secure in Christianity, secure in union with Christ in these things. So, you know, are we, you know, that's the question. What are we pressing for? Trying to, trying to have Jesus in us in such a manner that we're real pleasing to God? Well, that's fine, but that's actually fruit. 
And if we don't, if we don't solidify ourselves in the secure place, that's never going to pop out of us. It's never going to pop out of us. There's no way that it can be. Um, all right, and then uh, let's see. All right, let's go to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. <clears throat> You'll know, have to excuse me. I feel like I'm dragging a little bit up here, not necessarily in my preaching, but just physically it's... No, it's not that. It's I'm old. <laughs> Need a Mountain Dew. No, thank you. I'm good. Yeah. <clears throat> right now I need a Mountain Dew, so thank you. <clears throat> okay, Galatians chapter 3, and let's start at verse 6, and we'll go down several verses here. Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they who are of the faith, the same of, of faith, the same are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles through faith, preached before the gospel, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they who are of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. All right. So this, this, this says that the gospel was preached to Abraham. Okay? Um, the gospel is preached to Abraham. All right. So let's see if we can do this. Uh, you're there. And you come to Abraham, and you want to preach the gospel to him. Okay? Ready? Go. Uh, Jesus died for your sins, and you need to get saved, and you need to repent, and you need to this and that, and shape up, and, and got to, you know, get on with God, and da 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 and come on, you only got, you know, 30 seconds left. And you, you know, and we go through all of the, the what we call the gospel. But, you know, there is no record of that being preached. There's no record of that being, you know. And yet, these scriptures are telling us that we need to copy the faith of Abraham. The faith of Abraham, the faith that was counted to him for righteousness. Is that mountain punch? Is the fact that the word punch in it is gonna give me a kickstart or something? Thank you. Um, so we're, you know, we are supposed to copy the faith or have the faith of Abraham in this reality. Well, I mean, how many people do you know that's talked to you and said, okay, now, if you really want a picture of the faith that you're supposed to have as a Christian that'll be counted to you for righteousness, let's go to Genesis. Well, Paul. <laughs> Paul. Paul does. All right. So why don't we just obey what he said and let's go to Genesis. Genesis chapter 12. Now, you know and I know when God speaks to you, it is important. Amen? I mean, you know, a preacher can speak to you and that's fine. But when God speaks to you, we go, hey, and we should. <clears throat> and here in these scriptures, the wording is to Abraham and it's very specific. And... Um, Sometimes we miss the major emphasis because we're looking for things that can apply to our life. You know what I mean? Because we're so set on 
fixing ourselves. <laughs> I was going to say me, but we're so set on fixing ourselves for God. Does that sound a little like a weird sentence? I'm going to fix myself for God, you know. And uh, I remember one time we were down at Mardi Gras and we had a Bible school student that was new. <clears throat> and I was standing there and he said, I'm going to go witness to that guy. You want to come with me? I said, sure. So the guy was smoking and and the guy, and so he starts telling him how he needs to quit smoking and come to Jesus. You know, and uh, the Bible says Jesus will make us fishers of men. Well, if you're going to be, a, if you know anything about fishing, you don't first clean a fish, then catch it. You know, you catch it and then you clean. <laughs> But we're trying to make everybody righteous. We're trying to get everybody to be right first. Well, we can't be right, not God's right, not God's rightness, and not God's righteousness, not Jesus made unto us righteousness. The best we can do is old covenant righteousness, meaning functioning off of a relationship where we're doing it to please God. And yet, when Jesus shows up, the heavens open, which never happened before. The heavens open, and God says, this is my beloved son, in whom, in whom I'm well pleased. So he wasn't just going, he's the only one I care about, to heck with all of you. He's saying, if you're in him, he's pleased. <laughs> which is a good thing, amen? Because that's not a work. Actually, it is a work. It was Jesus' work. But it's not our work. And, and as I said, you get in him, you get caught, you get in him, then, and you start functioning as a branch, you start functioning as a, a body instead of as a, you know, individual when I say individual, I don't mean you're not an individual. I mean on an individual basis of righteousness. You start functioning as a, as a branch. All the different fruit that God talks about coming forth in you will come forth. Not a work, but, but as a result of life. <clears throat> All right. So, uh, verse 1. Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. All right. So the first words, these are the first words spoken to Abraham when his name was still Abram. First words spoken. And he, what did God say? Shape up, do right, clean your act up, Try harder. Or, he didn't say this either. Get ready. You're in Christ. Everything's wonderful. You're in the land. He said, I want you to get out of the old and into the new. Get out of the old and into the new. Press toward the mark of the high calling. Be reconciled to God. Walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. All of those being the very same thing. This, the same words, I mean, not the same words, but the same concepts in different places spoken through God's vessels to the church so that we would read it. And here, have the faith of Abraham. Here... Now, the faith of Abraham is more than here, but it starts here. And it does say, in thee shall all the nations be blessed. And that was what was quoted in Galatians. Because as we are in Christ, all blessing comes forth. We've been, what does it say in Ephesians 1, 3? We've been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. All right. Well, that couldn't possibly be talking about Cadillacs and, you know, big McMansions and, you know, I don't know fine jewelry. I don't know. <laughs> you know. That couldn't possibly, because it's talking about spiritual blessings, okay? 
has the Lord ever um, blessed anyone here like with a car, somebody gave it and felt led of the Lord or something like that, something, raise your hand. Okay, Was, did you have to go up in Christ and find that car? You know, no, it's not in Christ. It's not, it, that car is not in resurrection. Okay. So the spiritual blessings are all of the resources that are Christ. Love, joy, peace, and all the things. You know, patience. Instead of being separate, being in the flesh, walking in the flesh and saying, Lord, give me patience. There is no, now no condemnation in Christ because there will come all of the things from the land. And you remember, that's what God told the Israel. God said, I want you to come out of Egypt. I want you to go through the wilderness, and I want you to go into the land. It is a good land. You won't have to build houses. You won't have to plant vineyards. It is a land that flows with milk and honey. It's all there. All you got to do is enter into it. It's, you know, and so he's going, you know. So what, what happens? They get to the edge of the land, go in, and they see some giants and they go, well, you know, they're not seeing the resource. I mean, they saw the resources, but they didn't think the resources of the land of Christ were adequate. They saw, they, remember they brought back fruit, grapes, and yeah, it was, yeah, it was huge. I don't know how huge, but it really talks, well, let's just put it this way. Just one part of the vine, two men had to carry it on their shoulders. That's Christ. But that's just nothing because the whole land is full of that. That's just a little tiny part of it. But you bring that back to the people and you show them that, not the whole land. And you say, okay, the, the resources are this big, this tall and right here. But the giants reach the ceiling and there's a ton of them. Only when you see the land, can you make a proper judgment? <clears throat> Someone else can, you know, go see the Lord and bring, and bring some stuff back and go, look, doesn't that look good? And until you see it, you'll look at that and compare that with the giants in your life. And you'll go, it's good, but it's not, you know, you know but they're, as good as this is, they're worse. They're bigger. They're meaner. They're, so I don't want to go in there because the challenges are too big. What is Joshua and Caleb, we are well able to over, let us go in at once. These are guys that saw it and weren't worrying about their flesh. These other guys are going, we went in, let's don't go in again. Okay, I'm here to tell you Jesus is sufficient. And I don't just mean the guy with sandals and white robe on, and long hair and a beard sitting on the throne. I'm not talking about that Jesus is sufficient. I'm talking about the Jesus that we are in that is seated on the throne, if you understand what I mean. Not just some sentimental, romantic picture of what Jesus would look like, you know. I mean, I've had people say, oh, you know, uh, there was this guy, and he died and went to heaven, and he saw Jesus. And Jesus had the most loving, kind eyes. If God, if God wanted us to be caught up in that stuff, in the Gospels, they would have, they would have, somebody would have said, and he had the most loving, kind eyes, or he had the sweetest face, or the expressions, or when, when he did. It never mentions any of that stuff. Don't you think that would be important? I mean, if you were writing the thing, if you walk with Jesus, don't you think you, unlike the called ones, the apostles, would have said, and his touch was the most gentle. I couldn't believe it. You know what I mean? You write all this stuff, and the Lord says, trash that, Holy Spirit. Because the emphasis is not on touch and sight and feel and all that stuff. The emphasis is on we are seated in him. And all, the, 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 all of the patience that we don't have is available to us, but only in him and therefore through us as branches. You know, so any thought of seeking patience apart from seeking Christ is ridiculous. See. 
I'm, I'm writing my newsletter right now. I've been writing it, actually, for a couple of weeks when I get some time. And, you know, I, I keep writing down that Jesus is not the causality of the things that we need. He is the substance of those by his being. That we've been joined to a person. We've been joined to Christ that we are in him and he is in us. And the hope, the hope, the hope for any of that stuff, patience or more love for people that are mean or all this, the hope is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And that only comes from you in Christ first. You in Christ. There has to be a settling of that stuff. Um, so I, I wrote, his first move was to get out from the old, pack up, say goodbye, get on your camel, and start heading out and away from where you're at right now. The old relationship, the way of relating to God in this land. Get over here in this land. This land requires you to be perfect, to be good, to be, you know, you, you be holy, you know. You, you need to sh display more holiness. This one says, be holy, for I am. Therefore, you can be because we're one. Being, being, you know. Be to the praise of my glory. Not just over here, praise and give me glory. But over here to be. Well, the only being that is to God's praise and glory is Christ and his body. That would be us. That would be us. That would be the ones that are joined to him in such a manner. First in faith, then in manifestation. First in faith, faith in Christ. And then in manifestation through us. But not concentrating on the manifestation. Okay. I mean, that'd be a little bit like planting a peach tree out here. And every day going out and going, well, where's the peaches? That's a good choice, Georgia. <laughs> peaches. <clears throat> where's the, you know, where's the beef? Where's the peaches, you know? Where are they? You know, and then every day go out and go, I don't know what's wrong with this thing, you know? And it's like little and it's growing, and, you know? And so a month passes and then six months and then a year. Where's the peaches? This thing ain't no good, you know? And it may be several years. It may be many years before manifestation happens. But the point is, if it was the right seed, it will manifest. Can we have faith in that? Can you have faith in that for your own life? Can you have faith in Jesus that he's the right seed? Can you have faith that that whatever failures that you've done are not the issue with him, that he, would, he doesn't want to concentrate on that. The sin question is done. He's already died for all sin. You do know that, don't you? I mean, if every time you sinned, he had to die, you know what I mean? Oh, I've sinned, Jesus. Get off the throne. Go back to the cross and die. It's finished. He, he doesn't go, oh, okay, i got to die again just because you messed up. He sits there and says, forgiveness is already yours. It's already yours. Just receive it. Receive it in me. Receive it as part of that whole package in Christ. And that's what Ephesians talked about. And Ephesians really is the book that just from start to finish pretty much deals with this. But he talks about salvation and forgiveness are in Christ. Because if it's based on you, you can lose your salvation. All right. All right, so, you know, Abraham, when he left, uh, let's, let's look at verse 5. And Abraham took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, and his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered and the souls that they had gotten 
in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, into the land, uh, into the land of Canaan, they came. All right. Now this is, you have to remember um, that he left where he was at, and then he went to Haran, which is still outside of the land. And he had all of these people with him. Abraham did. Abram had all these people with him. There was a short list right there because a bunch of them stayed back, his brother. And all of the people, if you remember the story when Isaac, when uh, Abraham went to get a bride for Isaac, he sent to Haran. It was this very place, and it was family, you know, ties. But they, those were not dwelling there in the land yet. And Abraham was not until a certain juncture. Even though he was leaving, he was not yet coming in. And so he stays there, I think, I forget now, but I, I've searched it out a couple of years. And finally he decides, you know what? I am not getting where God wants me to go, which is not some ministry or some level of spirituality, but to be found in Christ, not having your own righteousness. That's what Philippians talks about. To be freaking out and worried about you when you should be concentrating on him and he'll worry about you. Don't you remember that when you first got saved? There was this security and happiness that you knew Jesus was going to take care of you. Anybody remember that? <laughs> you remember the, the love of your youth? Well, he hadn't changed. You know, you all remember the story. Some of you remember the story where me and Deb are driving down the road and I'm driving. She's in the passenger side and she goes, golly, do you remember when you know, used to drive and I would sit right up next to you, you know? You know, what happened? And I said, well, I haven't changed. <laughs> you know, it was similar with Jesus. He hadn't changed. <laughs> he still will protect you, covers you in Christ. You are sheltered under the shadow of his wings in the reality because you are hidden in the secret place of the Most High God in Christ. All of that is his heart. That is his whole love and his whole desire. But then we slip out of that and we go back and start concentrating on ourselves. And then, then we start getting insecure because I'm not doing so good now, you know. And then we think that God's forsaken us and that God doesn't have any plans for us anymore and that God doesn't really love us and I must have done something wrong and surely I sinned and, you know, surely I've sinned so bad that that's why I feel like I'm out here in Haran. <laughs> and he's going, no, just step over the line. Because <laughs> Haran was right on the edge of the board. Just step over over the line. Come in to my reality of you being in Son, as it talks about in Hebrews, in Christ, and, and receive that as your faith, the way Abraham received that as his faith, and it's counted to him for righteousness. And instead of trying to worry about your righteousness, to, to concentrate on him, I press towards the mark. He didn't say I press towards the mark of the high calling of being good, or being Christ, <laughs> but of being found in him. All right, so when he left with all these people, I wrote, he did not leave the people, but he left the relationships. When he stepped over that line and left all those family members in Haran, he left the relationships in the flesh. He didn't leave the people but to know one another after the flesh, God says, no. Now we know, we know one another in Christ based on him. Um, if those relationships did not eventually move on into the new, then he moves on, but he still, you know, they're still his family because he wouldn't have been sending, 
you know, the two trips that he sent back or they sent back to get wives for Isaac and Jacob. It's not over with, but it's changed. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so I'll, I'm almost finished anyway. Wow. Abraham's goal was not just to get his family members saved, but to get himself firmly planted in Christ. And that, is, that should be our goal. Um, I remember that the Lord told me when I was in my early 20s and got saved and the opportunity opened for me to go to Bible school. And um, I didn't want, I wanted to go, but I didn't want to go because none of my family members were saved, none. My mom was still living with my stepfather, and there was a lot of problems in the home, and I wanted to be there for her as much as I could, even though I wasn't living in the home. And I remember getting serious with the Lord, and I said, Lord, I want to know you. I want to go to Bible school. I want to, I want to be saturated in the word. I don't want to just go to church and get, you know, house. if it's just once a week, you know, you just sort of get one little, and then the rest of the week voids it out. <laughs> you know, but a saturation. I wanted a saturation working in, in me. But I said, Lord, I just don't know if I can leave my family. I mean, I, you know, how can I walk off and not concentrate on getting them saved? And, and the Lord just very simply said to me, look, you take care of my things and I'll take care of yours. It sounds real simple, but you know, if God speaks that to you, it's powerful. <laughs> and it was powerful for me. And I realized that this is the way to go. And, I, and so I determined in my heart, Lord, I'm going to go with you and after you with all my heart, trusting what you're doing in them. Well, most of you know the story that I, I mean, I had three brothers and two sisters, um, stepfather and a mother, basically got to lead every one of them to the Lord. I mean, have every one of them pray a prayer. So I had every one of them bow their knee to the Lord. It was over a long period of time that it all happened, but it all finally happened. And when the last one was saved, I just looked up to the Lord and I just went, you are something else, Jesus. You are something else. And I just, you know what? I just love the Lord. I love the Lord. I love his faithfulness. I love that, that when we, we put our faith in him, not just at him, that he comes through, that he will meet the need, but everything needs to be swallowed up of him so that he has more authority. You know what I'm saying, more reach. Because if we're holding it all, he's got li very little reach. He can't act except on our faith. Amen? Well, why don't we just pray? Let's stand together and we'll... Father, my words are never sufficient. And I ask you to forgive me for that. But I know that it does not depend on me, but upon your Holy Spirit to touch our hearts. Father, all that we have said here is, is Jesus in, in the simplest of terms. We've just pointed to Jesus. We've just said, if you love Jesus, then get in him. Find yourself being found in him, not having your own righteousness. And Father, you know where each and every one of us are at, what things we deal, we're dealing with, what things in this world that seem so important. But there is one, one goal, one mark 
one high calling that above everything else our hearts yearn to grasp the truth of resurrection in Christ, Christ as our resurrection. That, that there all things are secure. That there, even when we fail in the earth, you have not changed your mind and you still see us there. And you long for us to find ourselves there to know you in that way, not in the flesh, not in the Gospels, but to know you in that way and to make our identity, to have our identity Christ and not how well we're doing in the earth. So Father, we ask you to quicken your word Soften our hearts and draw us into the good land, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Why don't you just hug a few people and be dismissed.